Welcome back to a very special edition of Ducks Dash, the University of Oregon show on Dash Sports. I'm Izzy LaRue. Here with me is Michael Streit. Michael, let's talk about this Pac-12 championship title. As you can see, the title of the show is back-to-back. -back. Oregon, they've done it. They've won back-to-back -back Pac-12 championships. They did it, Michael. So tell me, what, what's your feeling about this? Well, I'll start with what uh, Kayvon Thibodeau said after the game in the sort of botched trophy ceremony that happened. He said, I'm wearing two hats because we did this two times, you feel me? And Oregon is back-to-back -back Pac-12 champions in a season where they lost to two, um, two losing teams, two teams with a sub-500 record. This is something that absolutely nobody predicted. This is something that uh, felt pretty unlikely after what we saw against Oregon State and Cal. And yet, at the end of the day, Oregon is the back-to-back -back Pac-12 champs, and they are headed to the Fiesta Bowl. Um, I think more than anything, Izzy, this was a success on behalf of the coaches. I think this was the coaching staff doing everything they could to win this game despite being outmatched talent-wise by USC. And I think this is just an A-plus performance by Joe Moorhead, Andy Avalos, Mario Cristobal, and that coaching staff getting Oregon that big win. Yeah, and when you really think about it, I think Washington not being able to play in their last two games of the season really helped Oregon because that gave Oregon two weeks off. Now, if you have a team that yeah. is preparing 14 days to play against one team, they're obviously going to have the edge schematically. And you would talk about this USC team who played three games in 13 days. They weren't really ready for this Oregon game schematically because you talk about they found out Monday that they were playing Oregon because they had to prepare to play against Washington. Still, They still might have had Oregon in the back of their minds, but realistically they were looking at Washington. And then you look at, at it on a Monday, you're like, okay, now we have to switch to Oregon. And three, four days later, you're playing against this RPO offense, which is really hard in a regular week to scheme against defensively. And now you only have a shorn week on a Friday. I mean, you couldn't ask for a better situation for the Ducks to get this win. Yeah, we and I got to I got to shout out the uh, Reddit College Football Twitter account for really coming up with the perfect tweet to encapsulate how insane the Pac-12 was this year. So, Oregon was the Pac-12 champs. USC was the South Division champion. Washington was the North Division champion. Colorado is basically the highest ranked team in the Pac-12. Uh, Cal and Oregon State both beat the Pac-12 champion. Arizona State had the highest scoring margin in the Pac-12. You and it's incredible. I did some research myself also, Izzy. In the 43-year history of the Pac-10 and the Pac-12, only three times has a team been crowned the champion of the Pac-12 while they were unranked. 1983 UCLA, 1999 Stanford, and now Oregon, just the third time that a team was given that Pac-12 championship trophy – while still being unranked, um, definitely a, a weird situation to be in as a Ducks fan. Uh, just saying, you know, not sure if they deserve this, but we, they're the champs and they're going to party. Yeah, that was definitely a big topic of discussion, whether the Ducks deserve to be in that game or not. And I think they kind of answered those questions with the game that they played. 
I mean, especially defensively, yeah. they turned it around at the right moment at the end of the scene. You saw in the Cal game, you saw sparks of that defense doing really well, and but then the offense didn't show up. And then now you have the defense showing up and the offense too. And Michael, let's talk about this guy, Anthony Brown. He finally got playing time. It finally happened. I've been waiting all season for this. Anthony Brown, on his first pass as an Oregon Duck, it was a touchdown to Jalen Red. Michael, ah. Uh, Tell me, do you think Shuck or Brown should be starting? Wow. I mean, the quarterback thing is pretty remarkable because Oregon had about 100 passing yards as a team in that game, and yet they scored four touchdowns on four passing touchdowns. I wish I could punch into a database and see um, when the last time a team had four passing touchdowns with only 100 passing yards. And they came from two different quarterbacks. Anthony Brown, I mean, everyone's freaking out when he comes in, throws that touchdown pass, and you saw this interesting progression of him getting used more and more. First was just one play, throws a touchdown. Then it was like on a third and one or a fourth and one or something like that, a third and short, he comes in for the short yardage. Great. Then when it's first and goal, he comes in to start a drive, and it was the first time that – or not to start a drive, but it was the first time that he had played three consecutive plays back to back to back. Then, circling back to Tyler Shuck, I don't think he had a bad game, but he is definitely not the same quarterback we saw in the first two weeks of the season. He There's, there's a really great quarterback somewhere inside of Tyler Shuck, but his confidence has eroded. And I just think he's gotten worse as the season's gone on. He's just um, really in a slump. Um, and he had that interception. He had an awful throw, I think, early in the second half or late in the first half. But I'm pretty sure early in the second half he had an awful throw that should have been intercepted. And that was the last time that Tyler Shuck threw the ball deep down the field. For half of the game, there was no passing downfield for Oregon. It was handing off and screens, and they had to make that work for an entire second half. And it's pretty incredible. When you look back, watch that second half again, and look at Oregon on offense, they stopped throwing the ball 10-plus 10 y- 10 yards down the field um, because they had no faith in either of their quarterbacks to do that, and that is pretty wild to think about. Um, but it was great, great, great to see Anthony Brown. And I guess moving forward in the Fiesta Bowl, we'll talk about that later, but I, I expect the same thing. Tyler Shuck and Anthony Brown both mixing it up, and if Tyler Shuck really has a bad game again, then you might just see Anthony Brown close the season as Oregon's starting quarterback by just fully taking the reins. But they don't seem to have a lot of confidence in him either as far as throwing the ball you know, 10, 15, 20 yards downfield. What do you think about that, yeah, you men- you mentioned the conservative play calling in the second half, especially in the fourth quarter. That almost cost Oregon the game, if we're going to be honest. Uh, USC, they were, they were getting in that position where they're going to come back like they've been – they did against Arizona, Arizona State, UCLA. They were getting back into that position where they're going to come back from behind, win in the last minute, but Oregon's defense stepped up. And that was all because Oregon's offense couldn't really – get anything going because they're being so conservative. If, you, if you're if you playing conservative with the lead, you're just asking that lead to be cut down or even lose the lead. I mean, you've seen this happen to Oregon teams many times in years past, and now it, it almost came to haunt them in the Pac-12 championship game. So now I'm questioning whether will they trust these quarterbacks to throw down the field in the Fiesta Bowl? Because if they do not, Iowa State, they're going to have a field day because you can't win a game just based – having a hundred or less passing yards and then CJ Verdell, who knows if he's going to play because if he plays, then I feel more comfortable with them not passing as much, but if he doesn't play, it's just Travis Stein, Sean dollars and Cyrus Abibi Likio, they're going to be in a tough outing for um, the Fiesta bowl. Yeah. And the last thing I'll say is he put this game to bed is yes. USC was the better football team. Um, and they, you know, you talk to USC fans, really stunk and really choked uh, their opportunity. But if you go back to Oregon, the two games that they lost was a lack of leadership and discipline. And it was just sort of not being able to put together four good quarters. 
what you saw on Friday night was a team that won the turnover battle, committed less penalties, scored four touchdowns on their first four trips to the red zone, and played four good quarters. Did not have a bad quarter. They played their best game of the entire season, in my opinion, and that was a championship performance. They um, may have gotten a break from Keaton Slovis. They may have needed the miracle interception by Jamal Hill that literally nobody in the stadium thought was an interception until they watched the replay. They needed all these things to come together, and that just goes to show you what a um, you know not great Oregon team this is. But the team played a championship-level performance. And they earned that championship on the field. And they can continue to celebrate as back-to-back champs. Yeah, and I know the players were singing at the end. With all these, most, like, let's say half or less than half, like a third of these Oregon players and recruits, they're from SoCal, L.A. area. So they love to play at USC, at UCLA, in the Rose Bowl. Because that's where they're from. They love to show out for their friends and family. And that's exactly what Oregon did. And that's why you had Kayvon, Jordan Scott, all these other players talking about how Oregon runs L.A. Because that's true. They're L.A. kids playing in Oregon. So they're just coming back in their backyard and showing who really runs L.A. It's not these teams that are these college teams. It's the players from this city. So Oregon runs L.A. Remember that, USC and UCLA fans. Get ready for next season. I can't wait for this next game in the Fiesta Bowl. Michael, let's talk about um, what this season mean for what this season means for the Ducks because we were talking about it last week. It was kind of a gloomy episode. We were like, "Oh, Oregon, they're playing against Colorado in a throwaway game. They're, I mean, they're not going to get the chance to defend their Pac-12 title." But now, new week, new show, better show, more energized. They got to defend their Pac-12 title and become back-to-back champions. So, what does this season mean in total for the? ducks in the years to come and years past yeah this is and i think quite a few players and oregon fans were retweeting um a salty washington fan which by the way i want to mention i'm not seeing any washington fans in the chat today you usually <laughs> get a little bit of a uh, little bit of action from them and uh you know just just gonna pay attention to that silence that's in the chat today um We noticed that. But uh, there was someone on Twitter that said Oregon is the worst Pac-12 champion ever. And, you know, Washington would have won, blah, blah, blah. Oregon's the worst. And a lot of people obviously were throwing flack at that tweet, retweeting it, making fun of it. But the truth is that in the the Pac-12 has only been around for 10 years. The North, Pac-12 North, is 9-1 and one in those Pac-12 championship games, and it's pretty impressive how much the North has just completely dominated the South. But in those 10 years, out of those 10 teams, Oregon is the worst Pac-12 champion ever. That's just a fact. If Washington had won over USC, they would also be the worst. It's, it's a weird season where Oregon gets to be the champ, they earned it, but it's still a bad Oregon team um, in comparison to what we expect from what we saw last year and the high expectations for Oregon football next year. Um, this is sort of still this is this is what we talked about at the beginning of the season. I'd say where Oregon was in a rebuild. It was a rebuilding season. It was going to be a step back, but what could they do still in a season that's sort of a transition? They still won the Pac-12 title, and that is uh, pretty impressive for them to do that. And it's it's going to be a scary, scary roster next year, Izzy. Yeah, and that roster, it's going to be dependent, I think, solely on the quarterback. I mean, you mentioned it, um, the Oregon St. Cal games. It was because the quarterback play that Oregon was not able to win the games. You talk about Oregon State, obviously, the defense, they did not do their job allowing 41 points to – an Oregon State team and let Jamar Jefferson just run all over them. But now the defense, they're getting their stuff together. You see Noah Sewell, Kayvon Thibodeau, Jamal Hill. They're becoming – Verone McKinley, Mikhail Wright. They're becoming leaders of this defense. And you see them the, – the communication was just off the charts. 
in that Pac-12 championship game. You saw not one you, – they were silent pre-snap the whole entire game. They're communicating with each other, like saying who's going to cover who, uh, wh- what's the play call going to be, what, um, what, what they're seeing on the offense. And that's what you love to see from a defense, constant communication before the ball snapped. And when you see that, that's when you know the defense, they're truly cohesive. That's when you know there's leaders on that defense, and that's when you know that they can actually make stop and make plays. So that impressed me a lot. I hope they show that in the Fiesta Bowl and next year. But truly what's going to be determined if Oregon can truly take it to the next level in years to come is in their quarterback play. Will Tyler Shuck be the guy next year, or will it be one of their five-star recruit guys that they have on the bench or bringing in this year? So that's a question that's going to be answered in the off season, but I'm I'm just interested to see what that QB could, how that could be QB position is going to play out next year. Yeah, Oregon has demonstrated this year and in past years that they are capable of winning um, a Pac-12 title without a great quarterback. I mean, Tyler Shuck, especially in the later half, has been, in my opinion, a very average quarterback it's pretty funny i saw people saying keaton slovis had his worst game of the year through three interceptions and oregon fans would still gladly trade tyler shuck for keaton slovis to be the quarterback uh, um, i don't know about he that. still managed to play <laughs> uh, you can disagree with that i i personally would would take keaton slovis and he may you know even if he had a worse game than tyler because he had his worst game ever but uh He's he's had an impressive season. Uh, he's kind of been the bright spot for USC's entire year was him and those incredible wide receivers just making a lot of action, making those comebacks happen. But beside that point, we've seen that Oregon doesn't need a great quarterback to win the Pac-12 title. But to be a dynasty, to make a college football playoff appearance, to potentially – do any damage in the college football playoff, um, they need a great quarterback. They definitely do. They need – I mean, you look at the quarterbacks that are in the college football playoff this year. Ian Book, Trevor Lawrence, Justin Fields, and Mac Jones. Those four quarterbacks, they may well be the four best quarterbacks in the country. At the very least, they're all um, the best quarterbacks in their conference. You know what I mean? It's yeah, and they were all. It's something I, that Oregon's got to find their. The yeah, they're all in that consideration, and Oregon's got to find that guy. They had Herbert, they had Mariota, they got to find the next guy if they're going to be a top four team in the country. Um, but they can definitely hang around to the top ten and the top fifteen in future years as they figure it out. Um, and another thing is Oregon has never had three straight first round draft picks. I was kind of surprised, but Oregon has never had three straight years with a duck going in the first round. Justin Herbert went top 10 this year. We all expect Panay Sewell to go top 10 and Javon Holland as well as probably a first rounder. And next year is Kayvon Thibodeau's year in the NFL draft to probably go top 10 because he was ridiculously good and was crowned the MVP of the championship game. Um, So Oregon has these, like, you know, program-changing caliber players coming through the door, and they just have to keep keep that turnstile going. You know, who are going to be the next first-round draft picks? You know, top first three-round draft picks for Oregon that are being recruited, that are, you know, red-shirting perhaps this year, Noah Sewell perhaps, these guys that – Got to keep the the dynasty, the dominance going for Oregon. Yeah, and uh, you look at this Oregon team, where they're at right now, especially defensively and with some of the offensive weapons that they have. Their window for uh, a, tit- a national championship title is, I believe, two, two, two to three years, but mainly two years. These next, these next two years, and it's probably going to be not next year, but the year after. And to have that, like Michael, you said, they have to have a great quarterback. So you're hoping that one of these five-star guys that's on the bench are about to come in next year, they have to be one of the guys. They have to be a Mariota level, a Herbert level, a person that can be on the Heisman watch or one of Heisman. Because if you don't have a Heisman caliber quarterback, you're not one of the best 
teams in the country, in the nation, because you look at the other teams like Alabama, Clemson, and Ohio, they're always going to get theirs in recruits. I mean, you saw it there in the top five, Oregon's top six, now in the 2021 class, because some guys decommitted throughout the season. Those three teams are always going to be in the top five of recruiting classes for years to come. So you just have to make sure that you, the guys that you do get, you have to make sure that they will develop and you have to get that quarterback that will be the answer, that will be the next Herbert, the next Mariota. And I'm I'm hoping that Oregon's found their guy. We'll see in the offseason. But I think they, ha- they have a two-year window to win a national title. Yeah, it's going to be a short window either way. Um, you really have to, for a team like Oregon, out in the Pac-12, you got to have the stars align. Um to make to make a run, you know, um, it's going to be like you said a two two year window pretty much, and they got to have a Heisman quarterback during that window. Um, every year we're seeing these these incredible quarterbacks lifting up the trophy at the end. And um, another thing is that they got to survive the Pac-12. I mean, Oregon has to make a undefeated Pac-12 run. They got to just dominate the Pac-12 schedule which they haven't done before, and it is incredibly hard to do in the Pac-12. Yeah, let's go to our last topic of the show. How will Oregon do in the Fiesta Bowl? Now, the Fiesta, their bowl matchup was just announced at um, around 11.30-ish, 11.37. So uh, we found out Oregon will play Iowa State in that Fiesta Bowl in Glendale, Arizona, and we didn't really get much time to – because I don't think, Michael, have you seen Arizona State play this year yet? I've heard good things about Iowa State. I was frankly a bit disappointed that Oregon won't be playing Oklahoma, just in terms of, I guess, branding and the fact that they were the fourth and fifth best teams in the country last year. I wanted Oregon versus Oklahoma, but Oklahoma's got a date with Florida, who is a, you know, a little bit higher caliber opponent right now. So the uh, Fiesta Bowl is going to have to be settled between Oregon and Iowa State, like you said. Iowa State is a team that will eat the Ducks alive if they don't score points. If they do not come in with a good game plan, if they do not get good performances from Anthony Brown or Tyler Shuck, Iowa State is going to make it ugly. I, I don't see Iowa State playing a bad game, honestly. Like, they're a really great, great team built from top to bottom. And they, they've they lost a lot of games this year, to be, to be fair to them. I think they've lost three times. So, you know, they're not they, – they, they weren't able to win the Big 12 title. So, Oregon's definitely got a chance to win this game. But they have to take that performance against USC, and they have to be even better than that. they got to take it to a whole nother level – and the USC game felt like, you know, the stars aligning. They did everything that they needed to do, and they got a pretty terrible performance by USC. I don't see that happening again. They need Iowa State to uh, not play their game, and they have to go uh, to a whole nother level. Yeah, especially with the offense that Iowa State has. Their offense, it's a really tricky offense to scheme defensively. So, I mean, these – 13, 14 days that Oregon has to prepare for this game. They're gonna. It's gonna be really important how Andy Avalos prepares his defense for this game. If he gets a great defensive plan to stop this Iowa defense, gets his. Especially look at the DBs. Mikael Wright has been great. Roman Lee has been great. Jamal Hill has been great. He saw. I don't. I don't know if Jamal Hill will be available for that game because he saw on that pick that he had to seal the game. Um, Something happens his hamstring. Maybe he tore it. Maybe it was a strain. Even even if it was a strain, he still would be questionable for that game just because of how long it would take to recover from a hamstring strain. But you look at the guy who opted out and then came back in DD Lanier, Lenore. He hasn't really great this season. I mean, he's had flashes. You saw the pick that he against, had against USC, but that was just a bad throw by Keaton Slovis. That was a miscommunication between yeah. him and his receiver. And you saw how Lenore did in the game. I mean, he had two blown coverages, and one of them was for 20 yards, a 20-yard pickup. And the other one was an Amal Ross St. Brown touchdown where he saw he just – he fell. 
he felt he 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 got mixed up. He fell, and Amon Ra just walked in for that touchdown. So, I mean, I was talking about that he's going to be the key in the DBs, whether if he does well or not, if they're going to play, if they're going to win that game. And he did just okay. He has to be more consistent to be able to elevate that the those DBs because if he does his job well, you know the other guys they're going to do their job well. That means defensively in the passing game they will stop most of the passes. And then when you add in the D line, how they've been performing, it's going to be hard on quarterbacks to make those throws, but he just has to play better and do his job as a cornerback. Yeah. The Amador Lenore was with Thomas Graham Jr. And Javon Holland and opting out. He decided to come back. And the sad thing is, I don't think it helped his draft stock. He's been, been okay. He hasn't had like a, phenomenal senior season that you would want and it's been interesting because I talked about how with a new offensive coordinator and a lot of new faces maybe the Oregon offense would just be really stuck in the mud um, for the first few weeks and that that would be the, the difficulty but instead the offense exploded onto the scene and then has had um, a decline as the season's gone on and you're seeing the opposite from the defense where the defense has looked really young, inexperienced, and just way out of it. And you see these guys like Diamador Lenore, Isaac Slade Matautia, Jordan Scott. These are very talented players. And these are players that when you look at all the names on that defense, you think they, they should be doing a lot better than they are. But at the end of the day, they just were still young and still inexperienced. And, the leadership and the communication and the game planning, I guess, all of that wasn't there. And it was a really, really and just terrible season, you know, stretch for that Oregon defense. They finally figured it out against Cal. And against USC, they brought the same fire. They got three interceptions. The defense absolutely did its job in shutting down a really potent USC offense. And this is a defense that Izzy, we both thought would very clearly be the best in the Pac-12. And they just aren't. They aren't the best in the Pac-12. They didn't play like that. But now at the very tail end of the season, they're starting to look great again. And they're going to need to be great against Iowa State for Oregon to uh, come out on top in the Fiesta Bowl, where they will probably be bigger underdogs to Iowa State than they were against USC, even after taking down USC. They still, I expect will be big underdogs. Yeah, and that quarterback position, that's going to be a big question mark. Are they going to go with Shuck again and then bring in some a mix of him and Anthony Brown, or are they going to go with Anthony Brown the whole entire game? I think that's going to be interesting to see how that will play on the next two weeks. And honestly, I, I figure, like, why not go both? I mean, Shuck, he's, he can obviously get yards with his legs, and Anthony Brown, he, showed, he felt really comfortable in that RPO offense, I think, if we see him get more reps in practice with the first team, and then that will translate greatly in the game. I mean, you saw with DJ Johnson, Jalen Red, how he read the DNs perfectly to throw it over top for those easy touchdowns. So this is going to be an interesting game. Um, Oregon, they get one of those New York Six Bowls games that fans expected. It, it's been a great season for them. Um, they they pulled it together at the end after what looked like it was going to be a lost season, and hats off to them. So. Um, we'll wrap it up right now. Um, thank you for everyone watching. Make sure to check out columns that our other Dash Sports hosts do for sportspack12.com. And make sure to follow us at Dash Sports TV on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, and Facebook. Check out our website at dashsports.tv and make sure to catch our weekly show Sundays at 1 p.m. The two times.